It is my honor and privilege to introduce uh, Kianga Yamata Taylor. Required reading for activists, for historians, for those frustrated with the status quo, and for those aspiring towards alternative futures and other ways of living. This is the unequivocal refrain that one reads in the glowing reviews of Kianga Yamata Taylor's published work. Astra Taylor cites it as, quote, a clear-eyed and morally righteous work informed by a deep understanding of history and social policy, one that patiently and painstakingly illustrates the ways racism and capitalism are intertwined. Cedric G. Johnson recommends it to everyone who has grown sick of too many undeserved deaths and the, at the hands of police and vigilantes should read and debate this book. Kianga Yamata Taylor is an activist, organizer, and assistant professor at the Center for African American Studies at Princeton University. She is author of From Hashtag Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, published by Haymarket Books in 2016. It explores the history and politics of black America and the development of the social movement Black Lives Matter in response to police violence in the United States. The book was awarded the Lannan Foundation's Cultural Freedom Award for an especially notable book. More recently, Taylor edited the equally acclaimed 2017 collection, How We Get Free, Black Feminism and the Kambahi River Collective, which the New York Times described as, quote, a collection that reminds us that black women have long known that America's destiny is inseparable from how it treats them, and the nation ignores this truth at its peril. Taylor's research examines black politics, housing inequality, and issues of race and class in the United States. Her articles have been published in Souls, a critical journal of black politics, Culture and Society, Jacobin, New Politics, The New Commentator, Black, Ag black Agenda Report, Ms., and elsewhere. She is currently working on a manuscript titled Race for Profit, Black Housing and the Urban Crisis of the 1970s, which looks at the federal government's promotion of single-family home ownership in black communities after the urban rebellions of the 1960s and how the federal government's turn to market-based solutions in its low-income housing programs in the 1970s impacted black neighborhoods, black women on welfare, and emergent discourses on the urban quote-unquote underclass. As one of the most inspiring voices writing and working in this field, we at BCRW are thrilled to host her as part of our Poverty and Housing Working Group. Please join me in welcoming Kianga Yamata Taylor. Hello. All right, so um, I'm gonna speak for probably uh, 35 minutes and I'm trying to do many different things in this uh, talk, so I just ask you to follow with me. And I always, uh, you know, offer these talks in the spirit of provocation, um, and I do that again tonight. It's been six months since the President of the United States, Donald Trump, sympathized with rampaging white supremacists in Charlottesville, Virginia. In the summer heat of August in Virginia, a mob of torch-bearing Nazis chanted, blood and soil, and Jews will not replace us. Hours later, Nazis marched during the day as an act of intimidation. They brandished rifles and other firearms. Some of the racists set upon young black men in the area, beating one of them until he was unconscious. And in a final act of racial terrorism, Nazi James Field killed Charlottesville local Heather Heyer when he drove his car into a crowd of anti-racist socialists and activists. It was the kind of brazen act of racial terrorism that even a year ago seemed unthinkable. But the rise of Donald Trump has activated what once was considered a racist fringe. He has emboldened the racist right to emerge from its shadows in our streets to speak on our campuses, and to murder. Indeed, in response to the Charlottesville rampage, Donald Trump defended the torch-bearing marchers, claiming that they were, quote, fine people. 
He went on to blame both sides for the racist melee in Charlottesville, even though right-wing fascists had organized their events under the banner called Unite the Right. Predictably, the racist right celebrated their mouthpiece in the White House. After Trump's conference, press conference about Charlottesville, David Duke, the former Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, tweeted, quote, thank you, President Trump, for your honesty and courage to tell the truth about Charlottesville. One year into the Trump presidency, it seems almost absurd to ask if Trump is a racist, as the media often does. From the Muslim ban in the hours after he was inaugurated as president, to the immigration control enforcement raids and deportations, to the defense of white racists in Charlottesville, to the defense of Confederate con uh, monuments across the South, to his recent declaration that Haiti, El Salvador, and various African countries are, quote, shitholes. It is no exaggeration to say that the Republican Party, led by Donald J. Trump, has become the party of white supremacy, indeed, and in word. With each revealing utterance of racist contempt that leeches from the lips of Trump, the Republican Party recoils in supposed shock. But their actions speak as loudly as Trump's catcalls to the neo-Nazis and the so-called white nationalists. After all, the Republicans' open disdain for multiculturalism, affirmative action, immigrant rights, trans equality, abortion rights, combined with visceral anti-Muslim hatred, meshes seamlessly with the politics of the alt-right or white supremacists who believe that all of these issues represent what they refer to as white genocide. The veracity of this statement should not be weighed simply by my saying it. The truth can be measured in the weight of the bodies of those who have been killed by right-wing incitement and violence. Heather Heyer, Ricky John Best, Taliesin Namke Mecha, Richard W. Collins III, Shravinas Kuchbala, Blaze Bernstein. For anyone who considers this to be a harsh assessment of Republicans, then you are either willfully ignorant or not paying attention, or worse. Trump has indiscriminately described Mexican immigrants as rapists, drug dealers, is reported to have complained that Haitians have come to this country with AIDS and that Nigerians live in huts. And with each racist comment, it is met by silence from the Republican Party. And it's not just Trump, but that he has widened the space for open racism to course through the veins of the Republican Party. Consider the words of Republican congressmen and the silence that has been met with those words. Congressman Clay Higgins, Louisiana Republican, said last June, quote, the free world, all of Christendom, is at war with Islamic horror. Not a single radicalized Islamic suspect should be granted any measure of quarter. Their intended entry to the American homeland should be summarily denied. Every conceivable measure should be engaged to hunt them down. Hunt them, identify them, and kill them. Kill them all. For the sake of all that is good and righteous, kill them all. Clay Higgins, June 5th, 2017. Quote, you cannot rebuild your civilization with somebody else's babies. You've got to keep your birth rate up and that you need to teach your children your values. Congressman Stephen King, Iowa Republican, March 3rd, March 13th, 2017. Trump's public comments on Charlottesville, his comments about, quote, shithole countries, these are not accidents, these are not slips of the tongue or examples of Trump's impolitic and impetuousness. Those comments are the logical conclusion of a man endorsed and adored by the Ku Klux Klan. His candidacy and his presidency have been greeted with enthusiasm from white supremacists, neo-Nazis, and other organized racist hate groups. Steve Bannon, a self-described architect of the so-called alt-right, was Trump's chief strategist. Steve Miller, 
a mouthpiece for alt-right politics, remains as a strategist and is alleged to be the architect of Trump's racist immigration policies. It is not hyperbole to say that white supremacy is resting at the heart of American politics. The Republican Party of today is the inheritor of the openly racist Dixiecrats of the 1950s and 60s. They, like George Wallace, Strom Thurmond, and other racists of the Democratic Party, learned long ago that open displays of racial hatred were no longer socially acceptable or politically tenable. Not only did the Civil Rights Movement open up the right of black people to vote in the South, but it made racism morally repugnant. This turn away from open racism did not, of course, mean the abandonment of racism. Exchanging the sheets of the Klan for the suit of the congressman did not change what existed beneath. Or as Republican Lee Atwater, Republican strategist Lee Atwater in 1981 interview put it more clearly, quote, you start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger. That hurts you, it backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff, and you're getting so abstract. Now you're talking about cutting taxes, and all these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and a byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. We want to cut this. is much more abstract than even the busing thing, and it's a hell of a lot more abstract than nigger, nigger. Charlottesville and the recent racist pronouncements of Trump have upended these lessons described above and represent a retreat into racial politics perhaps not seen in the White House since Woodrow Wilson was president. The dismissal and later ostracizing of Steve Bannon and the firing of Sebastian Gorka were watered down efforts to make it appear that the Trump administration was finally conforming to the norms of American governance enacting racist policies without the, obvious scour without the scourge of obvious racism. In some ways, this was a particular history that involves African Americans and our history as the enslaved, the legally discriminated against citizens of this nation. Over the course of the first 60 years of the 20th century, racism and discrimination against black people threatened the efforts of the United States to project itself as the moral barometer of the world. Of course, it had the ability to make these assertions militarily, but in the supercharged ideological battlefield of the Cold War, the US casting itself in opposition to the Soviet Union as more free, just, and democratic was more effective. But this embrace of color blindness was not a turn against racism. In some ways, it called for a more deep and pervasive kind of racism to explain the massive inequality and injustice that have always been the hallmarks of American society. No longer being able to use racist slurs, elected officials and the mainstream media begin to question black families, black morality, and black culture as the true obstacles to social stability and mobility. Trump has been more reluctant to use anti-black slurs in the same way that he weaponizes the language direct, directed at others. Indeed, during Trump's campaign, his team organized black outreach, including a, quote, New Deal for African Americans, a page that was posted on his campaign website. The outreach was an effort to use racism to appeal to African Americans, including a promise to, quote, deport illegal immigrants. His campaign website read, quote, no group has been more economically harmed by decades of illegal immigration than low-income African-American workers. We will suspend reckless refugee admissions from terror-prone regions that cost hundreds of billions of dollars. We will use a portion of the money saved by enforcing our laws and suspending refugees to reinvest in our inner cities. Republicans, including Trump, in the last 40 years or so, have always made half-hearted overtures to African Americans and other ethnic minorities to provide a gloss of legitimacy to their punitive political program. But more importantly, these half-hearted efforts are designed 
to uphold the illusion of the U.S. as a colorblind society. Not only colorblind, but a society with unfettered opportunity and no obstacles to success, which is what Trump said at the end of his State of the Union address um, six weeks ago. But these efforts at colorblindness are clearly not the same as anti-racism. In fact, they are based on a denial of racism in the present and the past because, in part, its acknowledgment would legitimize the demands of black and brown people for legal and material redress for the histories of oppression and exploitation that have made the United States the richest and most powerful country on earth. In lieu of acknowledging this history, the political establishment attempts to unite ordinary Americans around cheap appeals to nationalism, militarism, and racism. And while those appeals can be seductive, they are also fragile and freighted with the contradictions of this country's record at home and what it has done abroad. It is freighted with the contradiction of history. Consider Trump's bellicose taunts of war with North Korea or bipartisan threats to intervene in Venezuela. Aside from the enormous cost of war and occupation abroad, and its cost is enormous, tens of billions of dollars a month while the infrastructures of our cities and neighborhoods crumble. But more importantly, the racism that is used to dehumanize those we are at war with and those countries the U.S. is occupying normalizes and legitimizes racism at home. We see this with the open hatred of immigrants and Muslims, but that it is also unleashed against others, others who fit that category in this country. It normalizes and legitimizes the security state, more police, more surveillance, more private prisons, more repression. It has justified the continued expense of billions for the war at home apparatus. Promises to create the good life at home by destroying the lives of black and brown people abroad has its limits. More importantly, while this country's security forces hunt brown people to detain and deport them, and while the police forces of this country continue to murder black people, it raises the question of where does the United States derive its moral authority to go to war with anyone? But with no substantive program offered to working class people at home, the Republican Party has doubled down on racism and racist rhetoric instead. And part of that is because they actually have no solutions to economic inequality. In fact, their policies promise to make economic inequality worse. They promise to make poverty worse. And so in the absence of policies and legislation that could alleviate suffering, they follow in a long political tradition in the United States of blaming the most vulnerable for their own suffering. Or they simply blame the poor and working class for the problems of other poor and working class people. Thus, the Republicans have mastered the rhetoric of blaming Mexican and Central American immigrants for unemployment and low wages, the incitement of hatred against Arabs and Muslims, and the, the, when, with no intention of expanding public services or the public infrastructure, they double down on claims of old stereotypes about a supposedly inferior black culture to explain away the crumbling condition of working class, black, urban, and suburban communities. And where state-sanctioned violence is not invoked, the elected right uses its broader right-wing forces, whether they are organized racist on the streets or whether it is Fox News, to enact a different kind of force to attack those it perceives to be its enemies. And who are its enemies? At its national meeting last April, the National Rifle Association's president, Wayne LaPierre, said, quote, it is up to us to speak up against the three most dangerous voices in America, academic elites, political elites, and media elites. These are the greatest domestic threats. The attack on academic freedom and the free speech of left-wing and radical faculty is not happening in a vacuum. Rather, it is part of a concerted effort 
of the right to forcefully advance a reactionary and unpopular political and economic agenda by attacking any opposition to it. Consider the current debates around gun control. In fact, there is no debate on basic questions like banning assault weapons and universal background checks, whatever you think of these policies, they are overwhelmingly supported by Americans, and it's not even close. And yet our government acts as if these are highly contentious issues of which there is little agreement. And this is like much of the programming of the right. And so forces connected to the right resort to rhetorical and physical violence to advance their agenda precisely because of its lack of popular support. And it's orchestrated. Fox News published a story about a commencement address I was invited to deliver at Hampshire College last May. Fox based their news report about my speech from a story originally published by a Koch brother funded uh, media website called Campus Reform. In my opinion, both news organizations publish, published the story as an act of intimidation. Fox ran various news stories about my 19-minute speech for four days in a row over a holiday weekend with the intention of activating a racist mob made up of its readers and viewers. And as a result, within five days, I had received 54 hate-filled emails, including death threats. Within a week, I had received over 70 hate-filled emails. So for the right, it's not just the thrill of victory and humiliating weak administrators, but there is the agenda of isolating, intimidating, and ultimately silencing faculty, staff, and students who they view as a threat. The university is one of the few places in this country where at least if you are a faculty member or a student, you are supposed to have the right and ability to openly express your ideas. The right seeks to kill that atmosphere while simultaneously benefiting from it. If nothing else, the right wing recognized that part of the political struggle is a battle over ideas. That is why alt-right neo-Nazi Richard Spencer has been on a, speaking, uh, 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 a campus speaking tour. The right don't want to just have fistfights over their presence on campus, though they love the free attention that comes with it, but they actually want to speak on campuses. They believe that their ideas can get a hearing, and make no mistake about it, their ideas can get a hearing on and off of campus. The neo-Nazi thugs on the ground are the shock troops of the Republican Party. They are there to intimidate liberals and a broader left. The right in this country has always had a component of demagoguery, mob violence, and intimidation to push its politics. And it is because they ultimately represent the interest of an elite minority. Racism, bigotry, and violence are then central to holding its movement together. But racism in America is never just about racism for racism's sake. It is always in the service of a larger agenda. In the case of Trump, it's obvious. It is no coincidence that the racism animating much of Trump's political commentary accompany a harsh and draconian economic agenda intended to gut the living standards of the entire working class. While passing legislation that will redistribute, redistribute wealth from the bottom of society to the top, stealing from the poor and working class to make the rich richer, the ruling elite in this country continue to insist that the stagnation in living standards are the fault of the poor themselves. They have doubled down on the idea that the least powerful among us is responsible for the hardship experienced by millions in this country, while the rich white millionaires and billionaires at the helm of the government are innocent bystanders. But here is where the cynicism of both liberals and the right converge. Both think very little of ordinary people, what some of us refer to as the working class. And it's worth saying that the working class is not some media creation of old disgruntled white men with blue collars. The working class is made up of all of those who must work to survive in this country. It is multi-gendered, multi-ethnic, and multi-racial. It is native and immigrant, and it is most of us. White working class people are included in that. 
On the right, they believe that a steady diet of racism and war is enough to satisfy the appetite of working class white people. This is what Kellyanne Conway meant when she got into a post-election argument with the Clinton surrogate and sneered, quote, do you think you could have had a decent message for white working class voters? It's also what Donald Trump meant when he bragged that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and not lose any support. This is why Trump, in very calculated ways, makes outlandishly racist comments. He believes that he is feeding his base. But among liberals is a similar smug attitude. In their, ver in their version, ordinary white workers are portrayed as boorish Neanderthals who eat and drink racism, bathe in their privilege, and are an unchanging, ignorant bulwark against any and all progress in the United States. Of course, what gets lost in this stultifying picture of race, class, and consciousness is that the bulk of Trump's support did not come from working class white people. According to the most recent reports, Trump received a quarter of votes from whites without a college degree making under $50,000 a year, another third made between $50,000 and $100,000 a year, and another third made over $100,000. In other words, most of Trump's support came from middle class and rich white people. Two main things stand out about the election. One, Trump lost the election by more than three million votes. And second, the tens of millions of people did not vote. Of the 238 million eligible voters in the United States, only 137 million of them participated in the election. It means that more than 100 million people did not vote. So even when activists say that 94% of black women who cast votes voted for Clinton, they allied the fact that it was actually only 64% of eligible black women voters who voted, and that was down from 70% in 2012. Of course, we know that the Republican Party tries to find ways to strip black voters of their right to vote in general. And both parties make it exceedingly difficult for people to vote. But there are other reasons why every election, tens of millions of people sit it out. And the central reason, I argue, that tens of millions of people don't vote is because neither party offers a serious attempt to grapple with the vicious inequality that exists in this country. Those who continue to insist on unquestioned electoral support for the Democratic Party, while ordinary people get nothing in return, have lost touch with reality. The Democratic Party as an institution continues to blame its greatest failure in 2016 on Russia, Bernie, and anything except the most obvious explanations. It wasn't just that Clinton was a bad candidate, though she undoubtedly was. But the Democratic Party has an existential problem that means it will continue to put bad candidates forward. What I mean is that the party that regularly insists that it is the alternative to the cruelty and racism of the Republican Party is just as beholden to the rich and powerful. In the last presidential election, the Democratic Party raised more Wall Street money than Trump. Fully 80% of corporate donations went to Clinton and the DNC in the last election. This means that the party is just as beholden to the insurance industry, to the bankers, to the defense industry as the other party. They are just as committed to a foreign policy that is built on the oppression and exploitation of poor and working class black and brown people around the world, from Palestine to Honduras to Venezuela to Yemen to Afghanistan to Iraq. So when they run charismatic candidates like Obama, they inevitably disappoint because their policies accept and indeed reflect a political status quo that privileges the interests of the rich and powerful over the interests of ordinary people. The result is a kind of electoral cycle that trades the Democrats for Republicans and back to the Democrats and then back to the Republicans again. But in all of that, the fundamental problems in people's lives, poverty, 
economic insecurity, racism, policing, racist immigration policies are never actually resolved. Running a candidate who became a millionaire based on collecting speaking fees from the most powerful bank banks in the country while simultaneously insisting she is for ordinary working class people is to be grossly cynical about your electoral base. Angrily repeating that Trump is worse, and he undoubtedly is in every single way, will not change the fact that people want something to vote for, and simply saying that you are not Trump or a Republican is not enough. What is it that you are actually for? Indeed, after historic turnouts in the 2008 and 2012 elections, black voter turnout in a presidential election dropped for the first time in 20 years, falling to 59% after a high of 66% in 2012. And no, Charles Blow, it was not because of Russian memes. <laughs> but really, is this surprising? If you vote like you have never voted before to put a candidate who promises to change the world into office, as Obama did in 2008, what will you do for a candidate who promises you nothing? After all, Clinton insisted that America was already great. A stunning statement from a Democratic Party candidate running for president in the shadow of the Black Lives Matter movement. Instead of grappling with this issue, the Democratic Party has struggled to assess the election, let alone figure out how to politically pivot towards the issues that its base desperately craves. For months, Democrats have been transfixed by investigations into Russia. They have been dogged by infighting and insipid debates over whether identity or class represents the way forward for their party. A completely ludicrous debate that ignores that the vast majority of ordinary black and brown people are working class, and thus class issues are identity issues. Policing in black communities is a working class issue. Tickets, fees, and fines that stem from encounters with police exacerbate poverty and economic insecurity. The disproportionate targeting of black communities for policing means that African Americans are especially vulnerable to the financial burdens of encounters with police. It is also the case that young black men and women who encounter the criminal justice system and get police records as a result imperil their chances forever at stable employment. And so the criminal justice system fuels the underground economy and the violence connected to it when it drives ordinary people out of the above ground market because of the harm created by criminal records. Access to health insurance is a race and class issue. Black and brown people are disproportionately poorer in the United States and thus have less access to adequate or good health care. Moreover, their higher levels of poverty make them more susceptible to illness, disease, and other manifestations of the healthcare crisis. The crisis in jobs and employment, the ultimate markers of class and status in the United States, is undoubtedly a race issue. For the last 60 years, black unemployment has remained twice of what it is for white workers. In a city like Chicago, the implications are unmistakable. 50% of young black men in Chicago aged 20 to 24 are neither in school nor are they employed. 35% of black women in the same age group are also unemployed and out of school. These are not abstract debates of whether race is more important than class or if class is more important than race. In fact, race is the way that class inequality is mediated or managed in American capitalism. The political establishment, the ruling class, consciously uses a racially inflected concept of meritocracy to hide or obscure the obscene degree of class inequality in this country. They use racism to explain away inequality in general. This doesn't make class more important or race less important. 
Instead, it demonstrates that in this country, the two are linked inextricably. <coughs> Economic anxiety <coughs> has always been refracted through the lens of race in the United States. It is almost never by accident or happenstance, but the elite always seek to cultivate that. And if you think that economic anxiety, whether it is, is experienced by white working class people, Latinx, black, native, or immigrant, is just an excuse to be racist, it is only because the obscene material deprivation in this country is so hidden from view. Our country celebrates the rich, the beautiful, and the famous, while simultaneously ignoring and erasing the daily struggles of ordinary people. But the fate of both groups, the wealthy and the working class, are connected to each other. Capitalism is a system of economic exploitation of many by the few, and within every capitalist country is a small minority whose riches come from the labor and exploitation of millions. There are 400 billionaires in this country, and they exist because there are 45 million people living in poverty. They live well because so many live in poverty or near poverty or just above poverty or check to check. In a parasitic system such as this, those who sit on top are dependent on ideology to explain and rationalize the inequality that inevitably exists within their country. And it is not always racial. Often the division is religious or ethnicity or some other point of difference that can be exploited. In the United States, it is primarily race. Ideology comprises a set of ideas, concepts, rationalizations that are intended to make sense of reality. With regards to race and class, ideology is intended to make sense of the inequality experienced by black and brown people in this country that purports to have unfettered opportunities to anyone willing to work hard for them. In other words, how do we make sense of the American dream or this notion of American exceptionalism in the midst of such dramatic racial and economic inequality? Thus, we have the deployment of racist discourses that assume the inferiority of African Americans. Black people are unemployed because they're lazy. Black people live in inferior neighborhoods because they can't take care of their neighborhoods. Black people do worse in school because they don't care. All of this is intended to obscure the class relations and separation that define all of American society. When the ruling class and its institutions, the media, colleges and universities, attempt to explain the imbalance of power and wealth in our society, what we refer to as inequality, they have historically blamed poor people, black people, immigrants for the hardships experienced by the majority. It is basic self-preservation. It is class warfare. Not only does it sow division, but it also creates a counter argument to explain inequality. Blaming individuals for their hardship means that it is not the system that is the problem, it is the person. What is necessary then is not system change, but personal transformation. We see the constant return to these explanations. We hear it from Paul Ryan when a few years ago he described urban unemployment as the result of a quote, tailspin of culture that places no value on work. We hear it when Sarah Huckabee Sanders says that the violence in Chicago neighborhoods is a morality issue. But we also hear it when we see when Rahm Emanuel and Barack Obama also blame urban violence on the absence of role models and poor parenting. We see it in the formation of Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative, which is aimed at mentoring which implies that the problems experienced by urban youth, black and brown kids, black and brown boys, are mostly attitudinal and not institutional and structural. But it is not only black and brown people who experience this. As more ordinary white people become visible markers of the failure of capitalism, conservatives increasingly blame white poverty and social crises, most notably drug addiction, on a morality crisis. 
Charles Murray, who became famous by blaming black poverty on a biological disposition to behaviors that result in poverty, has a new book out. <laughs> it's called Coming Apart, The State of White America. And in it, he blames the decline in white working class standards of living on high divorce rates, out of wedlock, out of wedlock births, dwindling church attendance, and men who can't hold down jobs. Murray, in effect, has substituted poor and working class whites with the African Americans he used 30 years ago. He rehashes the same ideas to analyze white poverty that also concludes that low IQ and biology are factors. But instead of the biological differences being between black and white people, they are now between rich and poor white people. In the much lauded but underwhelming Hillbilly Elegy, written by Republican J.D. Vance about the place he grew up, he argues that white Appalachian poverty is driven by poor choices and behavior and morality, not material deprivation. But perhaps the most succinct contempt for poor and working class white people has come from an article written by Kevin Williamson that was published in the conservative journal National Review. In it, he wrote, and I'm going to quote at length, quote, if you spend time in hard scrabble white upstate New York or eastern Kentucky or my own native West Texas, and you take an honest look at the welfare dependency, the drug and alcohol dependency, the drug and alcohol addiction, the family anarchy, which is to say the whelping of human children with all the respect and wisdom of a stray dog, you will come to an awful realization. It wasn't Beijing. It wasn't even Washington as bad as Washington can be. Nothing happened to them. There wasn't some awful disaster. There wasn't a war or a famine or a plague or a foreign occupation. Even the economic changes of the past few decades do very little to explain the dysfunction and negligence and the incomprehensible malice of poor white America. The truth about these dysfunctional downscale communities is that they deserve to die. Economically, they are negative assets. Morally, they are indefensible. The white American underclass is enthralled to a vicious, selfish culture whose main products are misery and used heroin needles. Donald Trump's speeches make them feel good. So does Oxycontin. Of course, liberals don't provide a credible alternative to this unique American cruelty when they parrot the same contempt by reducing the experiences of ordinary white people to privilege in ways that do not resemble and certainly do not make sense of the actual experiences of white working class people. There are 20 million poor white people in this country. The imprisonment of white women is surging at rates even higher than they are for black women. And according to recent reports, it is largely driven by growing alcohol abuse and drug addiction. Indeed, the life expectancy for working class white women has decreased for two years in a row. This is unprecedented in a first world country, the reversal of life dependency, life expectancy. Life in poor and working class white enclaves is increasingly defined by economic insecurity, alcoholism, opioid addiction, and suicide. And while it is important to point out how elected officials are very willing to paint a sympathetic picture of opioid addiction as a healthcare issue and not a criminal issue, as they did with the crack phenomenon in the 1980s and 90s, because opioids have had a discernible impact on white people and crack was centered in black neighborhoods. I would caution against believing all the rhetoric that opioid addicts are getting loving care from the government. For example, in Middletown, Ohio, a town of 50,000 people that is 87% white, there have been 532 deaths as a result of opioid overdose last year. In response to that, a city council person proposed that drug addicts get two opportunities for medical treatment in the event of an overdose. But if there is a third call for an ambulance or medical treatment because of overdose, there should be no response. 
The councilman says the drug is too expensive at $36 a dosage. This is not white privilege. This is capitalism in its most savage form. The point of this is not to deny that racism exists among working class and poor white people, nor is it to ex suggest that these issues affect black, white, and Latinx people in the same way. They do not. Race and gender and national status and sexual orientation always compound and interlock with each other, creating even more profound means of suffering. Nor is it to deny that millions of ordinary white people who did vote for Trump did so because they were racist. So the point is not to deny the reality, the depth of racism in our society. It is to understand why it exists and to raise the question as to whether or not it can be challenged or changed. To believe that racism is unchanging leaves one with the difficult task of explaining the historic transformation of the United States in the last 100 years. Of course, it is easy to uniformly dismiss ordinary white workers as hopelessly racist, but in doing so, we uniformly give up on the chance to, or potential to build a genuine mass movement that can fundamentally change this country. In a country as racist as this one, it is not difficult to understand why the people who live here accept racist ideas. Of course, not everyone readily accepts racism to explain their life circumstances. Most people just blame themselves and the people they know and their families or neighborhoods for their troubles. But there is a difference between people's perception of reality and reality itself. Even when ordinary white people accept the idea that the stagnation in their living standards is because of the presence of immigrants or that the presidency of Barack Obama improved the standard of living of black people at their expense does not actually make it true. And the fact that it's not true means that those people have the capacity to see that it's not true. But it takes more than an assertion or an argument to convince people that their perceptions are not always reality. It takes radical politics and it takes struggle to uncover the true nature of any society, but especially one like ours where the political establishment regularly uses r rhetoric, lies, and distortion to obscure the truth. For example, the social eruption of Occupy Wall Street helped to lay bare how the wealthy live at the expense of everyone with the simple yet extraordinary clarifying calculus of the 1% versus the 99%. The Black Lives Matter movement helped to expose the systemic and routine ways that police abuse and violence shape the social reality of black communities. Despite the efforts of Trump, the Trump administration, and the Jefferson Beauregard Sessions-led and misnamed Department of Justice, their efforts to return to an era of mass incarceration of millions of African Americans and people including white people's consciousness, have been changed about the police. And it has educated, the Black Lives Matter movement has educated the country about the ways that black women experience police abuse and other forms of state-sanctioned violence, like nothing else. The Me Too phenomenon has exposed the lie that women's liberation can be reduced to the successes of a tiny minority of visible, rich, and powerful women. It has exposed the pervasiveness of sexism, rape culture, and sexual harassment and assault that permeates every corner of American society. Ten years ago, the immigrant rights movement brought millions of undocumented immigrants onto the streets and challenged the right wing's effort to criminalize their existence. Their struggle gave us the slogans, no human is illegal and undocumented and unafraid. The Dakota Access Pipeline struggle made the powerful connection between land rights of the indigenous and the need for an access to clean, unadulterated water. They also demonstrated what it means to struggle and how struggle can transform an impossible situation into a winnable one. Of course, none of these examples has been enough to completely transform the circumstance or conditions 
that they have exposed. And how could they? Racism, sexism, these are the lifeblood of American capitalism. We cannot end racism in a society where it is so tightly wound into the marrow of its bones that there has never been a single moment in the country's entire history where racial and ethnic subjugation were not core features of its public policies and private actions. This, of course, does not mean that we should sit back and do nothing. We have to be involved in organizing and building protests and demonstrations and building the social movements necessary to win concessions from the political and economic establishment. But this is not enough. Why? Because the crises we face are permanent problems of the market. Misery means profit. Hunger means profit. Disease means profit. Addiction means profit. Prisons mean profit. Racism means profit. Capitalism is killing our planet. It is destroying the lives of millions of people in this country. On the planet today, it is destroying the future. These are crises that extend beyond the capabilities of our feeble two-party system. For those who long for a return to the good old days when Barack Obama was president, or when Democrats controlled the Congress, they do so by forgetting or ignoring the tremendous continuity in racism, police abuse, poverty, suffering, and oppression that came before the Trump administration. From a relatively recent history of Hillary Clinton's description of black children as super predators, to Bill Clinton's promise to end welfare as we know it, to Barack Obama's description of the young rebels in the Baltimore uprising as thugs, the Democratic Party is not averse to using racism to advance a political agenda for them and not us. It is also true that there are better or worse elected officials. But, we can never, but what can never be forgotten is that in the constant weighing of who or what party is the greater or lesser evil, we never engage with the larger issue of how we get free. It is no mystery why socialism is no longer a dirty word in the United States. It is no mystery why 13 million people voted for an open socialist Bernie Sanders in this country. Not only is it an indictment of capitalism's failure, but it is also an expressed desire for a better way. It is the essence of hope. We want real democracy, where the people who create the wealth in this society are entitled to have a say in how it is distributed. We want real freedom, freedom from racism, imprisonment, borders, detention, and second-class personhood. It is something that no party can deliver. It is something we must be willing to fight for. Thank you.